so if God has always existed and we acknowledge that something can't come from nothing and God is something, it would beg the question, where did he come from? Well, no, because he didn't come from anything. He's <laughs> always existed. That's the point. But nothing the, the, nothing the, that no, we know of does that. Not Well, nothing that we know of, but based on the understanding that you and I have that something always existed, the question mm -hmm. of nothing comes from nothing only arises when nothing is the default state. But if something is the oh, default state, then you can't say, okay, so yeah. where did it come from? Yeah. We're live. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Charles has given me the amazing honor of being the host today <laughs> on his channel. And so, first and foremost, welcome to Critical African Thinkers, where we question everything under the microscope of logic and reason. Nothing is outside of our purview. And today, we are going to be having a couple of different conversations. But first, we want to welcome all the guests that are listening. Please like, share, and subscribe, because that's a that's a thing. But also we're going to we're going to try and promote Charles's new book that's coming out here pretty soon. It's a collection of poems and I thought it might be a good idea to start out, well first and foremost ask Charles how he's doing, but then see if he's uh ready and willing to share one of uh one of these amazing poems with us at the first of the podcast and and maybe share a couple throughout. So Charles, how are you doing, man? And thank you for uh, the amazing honor of being able to host this show. I'm doing fantastic, Steve. Thank you for agreeing to host the show. Now, this is something that I love doing. This is something I started doing a couple of years ago where we just have interesting conversations. I mean, that's what matters to me, searching for truth, searching for knowledge, trying to grow, trying to understand things. So yeah, yeah. it's good. Uh, and I appreciate you doing me the honor of hosting, hosting today's podcast. Where we're going to be having a debate like we've had before and yeah. in the course of it we're going to also be promoting my new book uh, which is a collection of poems which is now available on amazon there he is yeah so sorry about that uh it's all good something happened to my network connection and I yeah got cut off. yeah so I'm you're, back. you're gonna love what i talked about during oh okay so <laughs> <laughs> i need i need I a summary of that charles i, I took need a summary of that Oh, yeah. Basically, I talked about what we were going to be talking about, some of the uh, questions that we're going to be asking one another, the topics, and then I wished everybody a happy Pride Month. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd hate that. <laughs> David left. Pride, to go pride, back and watch pride good before destruction. <laughs> yeah. Haughtiness good before downfall. Anyway, well... Yeah. I don't believe in Pride Month and all those, uh, but you do, so it's yeah, an it open exists, platform. Yeah, so you yeah. can you can wish them all you want. I don't have to partake in it. But there's nope. this funny thing about right wingers getting so worked up and angry about uh, this whole Pride thing, and I'm like, nobody's forcing you to actually participate in this thing. So I don't yeah. get your anger. I don't get your, I don't get the vitriol. I mean. Don't participate in it if you don't like it. Why are yeah. you bitching about it? Why are you making so much of a fuss about it? In fact, it seems as if they are the ones who promote... They run a lot of publicity for the Pride Month every time, every year, because they whip up a lot of sentiment and it just gives it the kind of publicity that they themselves do not want. Yeah, so... Yeah. Well, you know, I was just talking about Trump a little bit and I, I, I don't follow it a lot, but uh, mm. if you don't want to add flames to the dumpster fire stop putting fuel on it it's as simple as that exactly you know but it's and the weird thing is is it's like a lot of conservatives here in the states are you know very they're very pro-individual right and it's weird that like the moment someone celebrates that individuality they're automatically like ah it's just not my individuality it's just it's just a weird weird thing it's like if i was a conservative i'd be out there being like yes this is the most american thing you can freaking do is celebrate who you are and you know celebrate what you are and that's awesome i don't agree with it but that's your that's your american right you should be doing that so i don't i don't understand the the hypocrisy the constant hypocrisy that we see from well both sides a lot but in this particular case from conservatives so, so yeah i, I think it. i think it's selective individualism because there are times when they would preach 
um, the individual is supreme but there are other times where they want a collective so make up your mind yeah make up your yeah. like, minds right this is a christian nation well that's a group <laughs> you exactly. know well, i'm a christian well you're putting yourself into a group of people so I, I think people just tend to not think about the things that come out of their mouth nearly as much as they probably should i'm probably guilty of it too but at least i can observe others doing it and they can call me out on it if they feel like it it's perfectly fine yeah but i think you're better than most many people are not that self-aware to be critical about their own thoughts about their own beliefs and i mean that's essentially what i've been doing for the last year i've been very critical of the things that i used to hold uh, the, the sort of opinions that i used to have and yeah i've modified a lot of them i've changed a lot of them and that has sort of had an impact in terms of uh, people who will, who will interact with me online on this channel because many of them think i've gone woke or whatever you right <laughs> deviating from what i used to say but it, it stems from a greater understanding a better understanding of the things that i'm talking about yeah uh, it wasn't as if i was wrong per se with the things i used to believe but that was the extent of my understanding at that point in time so i was yeah. operating based on the information that was available to me at that time and i've grown to have more information on these things on this topic so why why wouldn't i grow why shouldn't i grow and that's why it's so yeah. frustrating to me to see full grown men who haven't evolved in their thoughts, in their behaviors, in their thinking. They're still holding on to the archaic ideas that they've had for decades. There is no evolution in their thoughts. And I'm like, this is literally, I mean, it would take a conscious effort for you to not grow at all. Like you yeah. deliberately do not want to grow. Like, yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Absolutely, dude. And, and and the left does this too. Like we, uh, I mean, a lot of the reason why Ben Shapiro has those like gotcha mic drop moments is because he's arguing with individuals who are so enamored by their own ideological beliefs that they, they just have never questioned it. Therefore, they can never explain it. They can never, it, what, what was it? Uh, Einstein said that if you, if you can't explain a topic simply, then you don't understand it enough. And that's kind of the problem is they just have this, this belief that they just can't explain. They just want to rationalize it by being really outspoken or shouting people down, that kind of thing that happens all the time. But if they really thought about it, they would find so like if they just entertained difficult questions more frequently, like ch you know, things that challenged their beliefs and they were able to say, well, I don't know the answer to that I have a feeling. This is my feeling. But let me let me do some research and let me come back to this and see if I can explain my feelings a little bit better. And that's why the left is losing a lot of ground every day is because they just simply can't stand up to a question. And if you can't stand yeah. up to a question, you are going to you're, you're going to suck. This is going to be a really sucky time for you. And so my goal was coming onto your channel was kind of twofold. One was to represent kind of the left that I think I represent but also engage in conversations where we can we can kind of suss out what everybody like believes, what are the weak spots, what are the strengths, and, and just kind of talk to one another and see if we can't not just change people's minds, but see if we can't help learn more about the people that we inhabit this planet with and see if we can actually, you know, stand in their beliefs with them and say, hey, it's not for me, but I think, you know, you go get it. You know, you have the right to believe whatever you want to believe. I yeah. think that's where the left really suffers. Yeah. So let me play devil's advocate for the left. Let me try and still man them. I think sure. people on the left are very smart. They're very smart people. They are very well educated. And I think they are prone to delusions because of how smart they are. So at yeah. times, yeah. <laughs> at times, why it feels like the left is so emotive is that some things are just so painfully obvious to them that they don't believe they, they can't understand how this other person doesn't understand they can't get how this other human being doesn't understand what they're saying so it, it just becomes frustrating and they just they just blow up i mean look at what is happening with this current palestinian and israeli issue there have been protests by students for palestinians but you get people so, some people on the right saying these are pro-Hamas protests. 
or that these people don't know anything about the conflict. They're looking at it through a prism of an oppressor, oppressed, uh, oppressed narrative. They haven't taken the time to even ask these students, what exactly are they fighting for? They haven't taken the time to engage with this student, right? They haven't taken the time to say, do these students actually know what they're fighting for? And a lot of them do actually know what they are fighting for. Now, they yeah. might be hyperbolic. I mean, movements of change are never docile. You may not like right. their tactics, but you know, you need to get something done. People are dying in Gaza and they want, to, they want something to be done about it. Yeah. So their behavior is going to be hyperbolic. But when you have it, when you sit down with them and you have that conversation, then you'll be able to wrap your head around what their ideology or their aims are. But to just dismiss them and say, oh, these, even from supposedly smart people, someone like Bill Mayer, someone like Wilfred Riley on Twitter saying, oh, these are pro Hamas rally. I mean, doesn't make any sense. Anybody with yeah. two functioning brain cells know that these people are not protesting in favor of Hamas. They are protesting in favor of the Palestinian people. Of course, Hamas is part of the Palestinian people, but there is a bigger context here, right? But yeah. uh, that aside, the point I was driving at is that the the problem with the left is they get easily frustrated and irritated with the stupidity from the right that they just lose it and they're not able to engage in intellectual exchange because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And that's... Um... I think that's a a critical mistake that uh, the left that I feel like I belong to has made, and you know the to to steel man the the conservative side is is you know the conservatives they have deeply held beliefs and and one of those beliefs is unfortunately I would say is that the belief that the Jews cannot do anything wrong, and there's been plenty of of instances in the Israeli. Palestinian conflict where it's it's very clear that decisions were made that were not something that most you know Jewish folk in the United States agree with and in other locations um, there's a lot of European Jews that don't that don't follow or subscribe to what's going on there because there's different sects in within Judaism too you know you have the liberal Jews and you have the very conservative Jew and so these 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 groups still bicker and fight within themselves and they're the same faith you know so but the 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 strong suit that the christians have is is they are consistent in their beliefs they're very consistent and so they really hold their ground almost too much to a fault but their their main premises is like okay pro progress is fine but let's do it smartly and slowly and consistently and that doesn't jive with the progressive lefts who is like we need to make this change now so you've got some people who are too stubborn to move forward and others that are too stubborn to realize what the cost is if you move too quickly and so i think there's definitely issues on both sides there that need to be addressed but what do you say we get to your poem that you were going to read at the first of the podcast because yeah. we're 20 minutes in you haven't even read anything yet so let's let's hear something <laughs> Okay, and I'm glad so, to see that you uh, put the link down in the description or in, in the yeah. uh, comments. So I would say make sure you put it down in your in your actual video comments too, so that it doesn't get lost. Yeah. So let me just share the Amazon page first. This is the page. This is where you can get the book. It's uh, both in paperback and in the ebook, so you can get it. It's, it's a, a compilation of 28 poems that details my experiences. It's the way I was able to capture my emotions during certain events in my life. It was a way of me expressing myself. And this is the way I've always expressed myself. I don't talk so much. I, I write more and I write better than I talk. I would like to just share one of those points and read it. And then we can analyze it together. Steve can tell me what he thinks about it. And I will tell him my thoughts, what was going through my mind while I was writing that this poem is titled a phone call it goes like this it says a phone call with the shattering of a world as the splinters fly with careless abandon piercing my delicate heart stunned by its suddenness my heart dead as it would would not stare calm and resolve swept over the ocean of my being quite taken aback by the absence of a psychological tsunami even as the ocean bed of my heart erupted with violent earthquakes. Cloaks of heaviness bemoaned my countenance. Fetters of iron 
clench to my reasoning, sailing in despair as Charon waited to fairy reality to Hades. So this was a poem I wrote sometime around 2010. Yeah, 2010. Yeah, that was when I wrote this poem. It's a short poem, but you know, so what what do you think I was trying? What what do you think I was getting at there? Well, it sounds like you had a pretty traumatic event in your life that was relayed to you by phone, <laughs> mm -hmm. and uh, you can see and feel the depth and range of, of all of the emotions that you were feeling like frustration and anger and sadness. And I guess you would say surprise or disbelief that comes with those feelings as well. So yeah, I love it. I love it. I love your cadence as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So this poem, I wrote this poem when my grandmother died. Um, I was still an undergraduate. I was in my fourth year. My grandmother moved to the village the year prior. She was in the same city I was schooling in before they moved to the village. And so when she moved to the village, every time I go to the village, I I don't spend more than a day. And she was complaining that I don't spend time with her anymore because you know I just come and the next day I'm going back. So I told myself that, okay, that holiday, I was going to spend time with my grandmother, right? And I just finished my exams. So I was likely going to travel home the next week. And then the phone call comes in, right? My mom was mm -hmm. the one who called my, my grandmother was dead. And so so a phone call, that was a phone call with the shattering of a world. So it just shattered my world, it just broke my world. So as the splinters fly with careless abandon, piercing my delicate heart. So that information, that traumatic information, it was like a broken glass that was just flying all over and it pierced my heart. My heart was delicate and it pierced my heart. Now, stunned by its suddenness, my heart, dead as it would, would not stare. What is what I was trying to convey here is that the event was so traumatic that I went into a state of numbness. I almost could not believe that it was happening. So at that point in time, I couldn't even cry. I couldn't express any emotion because it was so traumatic. I did not expect my grandmother to die at that point in time because I had wanted to, you know, go to see her. Now, after I had gone through that emotion of or the non-emotion of being stunned. So calm and resolve swept over the ocean of my being. At this point, I was sort of recovering back from the shock, but then quite taken aback. I was surprised, okay, quite taken aback by the absence of a psychological tsunami. I was surprised at the fact that I, would, I didn't just break down into tears, like didn't lose myself at that point in time because I should be crying. I mean, this is the person that I loved the most in the world. I should be crying, I should be a mess. But I was surprisingly calm at that point in time. Even as the ocean bed of my heart er erupted with violent earthquakes. So despite the fact that in the exterior, I was you know, calm and, and all that. But internally, I was in turmoil. Now, cloaks of heaviness bemoaned my countenance. So this is where the sadness began to descend on me. Right? Like a cloak, something heavy was just dripped around my countenance. I was sad at that point in time. Now, fetters of iron clenched my reasoning. I couldn't think properly. I couldn't think straight. I was just in a state where I could not process my thoughts very well. Now, sailing yeah. in despair, I, I felt I felt despair at that point in time. As Charon waited to pharaoh reality to Hades. So Charon is the Greek god that carries dead people from this life to the afterlife or Hades. And uh, Hades is where the, the dead go. So what I was trying to convey here was that reality became fiction I, as in it, it was so unreal that i wanted what was happening to be transported into something else I, I didn't want it to be real in fact i did not believe it to be real at that point in time right so yeah. that was where i was getting that my reality was being taken into another dimension was being taken into another realm so that i can maintain my sanity so that i can wake up from this dream and say no my my grandmother is still alive so yeah, that was what was going through my mind and the emotions I was feeling while I was writing that poem. That's amazing, dude. Did you have, uh, were you experiencing feelings of guilt for not being able to, to follow through with your promise to her? Yeah, I was, I was part of the whole thing because I had promised her that I was going to come home. I promised her I was going to come spend time with her. Yeah. And 
that happened. I, I, I didn't fulfill my promise. Uh, every time I went home to the village to see her, I just spent a day and she would complain and I would tell her that when next I come. And so I just felt, it felt really, really bad for me. It felt empty that I couldn't keep that promise. Yeah. 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 That's always hard. Death is always something hard to deal with. And, and you know, it's, it, it's unfortunate that it is a, an absolute in this life, but uh, it's one that we always, you know, we always have to be aware of. And it's something that we're all going to face at one point in time, whether it's, loved ones or friends or even ourselves we're gonna have to come to terms with it at some point in time so it's yeah i've i've felt much of those feelings that you described there when you know i've had to to deal with the death of a of a loved one and it's it's definitely uh it's definitely something that i can relate to i appreciate you reading that so what do you say we get into this uh this conversation yeah yeah i i say let's let's dive right in this is the meat right. of the conversation so let's dive right in yeah absolutely and and, and so i i find a lot of these questions very very interesting and and i think we probably won't get through all of them because the first one is pretty heavy the first one's a pretty heavy question and, it, and it's one that philosophers have been debating for a long long time you know bertrand russell sean, uh, sean carroll have all spoken on this i mean books have been written on it it's a pretty weighty topic so uh the first question is why is there something rather than nothing um this is also otherwise known as the fundamental question of metaphysics so what is uh what is your position on this charles okay so why is there something rather than nothing right i believe that there was never nothing. There was always something. Right? The scientific view is that nothing comes from nothing. Nothing can come from nothing, right? Right. The states of matter and energy are interconvertible, right? Yep. Um, you you don't you don't lose anything. It's like a closed system. You don't actually create anything or you don't lose anything. It's just a conversion to a different state of being, state of existence. And I think that that view is very consistent and it's, it strongly reinforces for me the idea that if there is anything that has always existed, since nothing can come from nothing, then it has to be God, right? And, you know, that's a religious point of view. That's a religious worldview, right? Now, I think where science um, has an issue is if your claim is nothing can come from nothing, then how do you explain existence? How do you explain the current state of being? I mean, obviously things currently exist. How do you explain that? And I find the scientific worldview wholly incapable and insufficient to explain that paradox of nothing coming from nothing but in the religious worldview if something has always existed and that thing happens to be god then it logically follows that he could have created everything in which case it would not be contradictory to the scientific principle of nothing comes from nothing yeah so mm. So I, I hold the same belief, uh, or not the same belief, but I, I, I hold the same understanding that you do, that that uh, nothing has ever existed. There's always been some something that has existed. And well, let me let me ask you this question, because I think this needs to be resolved too, is is that if if the answer to the question for you is God, right? It poses a couple of different other problems, which one is, is, is you're just adding another question on, right? So if, if, if God did it, where did God come from? How did he actually physically create the universe? Because inside that question is the same question that science is trying to answer. Even if God did do it, how did he do it? Right. We have, we have uh, large Hadron colliders that have been testing these hypotheses for decades. This is a question that's been being attempted to be answered for a long, long time. So the difference between science and religion really is, is that one has one less question than the other. And so the question would be, 
if God does exist and if God did create the universe, how did he do it? And wherein lies the problem of the infinite regress? If he did it, where did he where did he come from? And where did he come from? And where did his father come from? And his father come from? Because if if the if the answer to that is, well, he's all he's always existed, that poses a whole nother line of questioning, right? Because nothing can come, you know, something can't come come from nothing. So where did he come from? You know, so how, how do you answer these, these, these questions? Okay. So first of all, I want to understand that you agree with me that nothing can come from nothing. It means anything in existence has to come from something prior. Yes. Okay. So the question about where did God come from doesn't arise if he always existed. The question of infinite regression doesn't come up. If the default state is something has always existed, and that thing that has always existed is God. So you can't ask, where did he come from when he's always existed? You only ask that in a situation where he has a definite origin. He has a definite beginning. Like the universe has a definite point in time that he came into existence. The Big Bang proves that. That is not the case with God. He's always existed. So the question doesn't arise, where did he come from? Because the default state is existence. That's what, mm -hmm. what is. From him came other things. Came matter, came energy, came the laws of physics and every other thing. But the scientific perspective, if, if we were to say, yes, we both agree that nothing can come from nothing. But something exists. Science cannot tell us why that is. That's mm. a fundamental principle that's broken by our mere existence. Something coming from nothing. The religious worldview doesn't have that constraint because the assumption is that something has always existed. But the scientific mm. worldview is, well, nothing can come from nothing. Well, we are here. We're not nothing. So where did we come from if nothing yeah. can come from nothing? So I guess let me pose the question differently here. So if God has always existed and we acknowledge that something can't come from nothing and God is something, it would beg the question, where did he come from? Well, no, because he didn't come from anything. He's always existed. That's the point. But nothing the, the, nothing no. that we know of does that. Not Well, nothing that we know of, but... Based on the understanding that you and I have that something always existed, the question mm -hmm. of nothing comes from nothing only arises when nothing is the default state. But if something is the oh, default state, then you understand? You can't say, okay, so yeah. where did it come from? Yeah. Okay. So if, if that's the case, we're, we're, we still have to deal with the, with the question of, of how did he do it? Right. That's that's a fundamental question right there. How did he create everything that was here? If that makes okay. sense. So if, if, if the universe started at the Big Bang. Right. And let's say that uh, let's just uh, let me see if I can steal Manny a little bit here. So let's say that God God took material that was infinitely small. Right. Much like what scientists say, you know, the Big Bang started from was a infinitely dense you know, little ball of everything. How did he take that? And how did he split that apart to create what we have here? Because that's the real big question here is like, do we need God to explain that? So because that's, uh, that's one more explanation that we have to tag on to the, to the question. So God is the essence of existence. Everything that is flows from him. Everything that exists comes from him. Mm -hmm. So we are an extension of his existence. The material world, the metaphysical world, and what have you, they are where we project from him. We're an extension of his existence. So how did he create it? How did he do all that? I may not be able to tell you specifically, but ignorance of a thing doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We mm -hmm. just have to try to make a link if this being that has always, if there's a being that's always existed, has no beginning, no end, then what is the 
why is it so why is it inconceivable that he could have created what we now see in the material world it's not inconceivable considering his his nature his state of always being so in, he encapsulates existence he encapsulates being mm. time space what what everything you want to think of they all flow from him they all emanate from him they are like pieces of himself that he has extended out into space space itself it's an extension of him yeah yeah i see what you're saying there you know and and you mentioned ignorance of a thing doesn't mean that it doesn't exist but the same the same kind of logic can also exist where ignorance of a thing doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and that's kind of the the fundamental problem that i i, I always come up against and and one that i uh that i had to answer for myself as an atheist is if I don't have it, if I don't have evidence of something, then I t tend to not believe it. So the 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 answer still doesn't follow from the premise, as far as I'm concerned. And I don't know how our viewers will feel, but please feel free to make a comment down in the section and let us know how you feel about uh, about this topic. But despite a lot of other uh, a lot of the other arguments that you've made. There's a, there's, a, there's a couple other questions inside there, too, which is, why is there nothing rather than something? And the reason why I pose that question is because, as far as we know, we're the only life in this entire universe, because we, we, we don't have evidence for it. Mathematically, it's, it's impossible that there's not more life out there. We just simply haven't found it yet. But it's, it's weird to me that, that God would create a nearly, as far as we can tell, infinite universe, mostly full of nothing, and not nothing in the sense of absolute nothingness. I'm saying there's there's a no, there's a nothingness between the stars, right? There's space is a very, I think people tend to not be able to comprehend how vast space is, but there's a lot of nothing between us and even the nearest solar system, and. If there's no life on any of these planets, and we're the only planet with life, it necessarily begs the question: Why do we? Why did he put into place all of this universe simply for our observation of it? He could have done half as much, and we still would have been intrigued. He could have put no stars in the night sky, and we would have never questioned it. So, yeah. what are, what are your thoughts on this position? Okay, so first of all, I think we're limited by our human understanding of things, just as much as a two-year-old child may not understand the intricacies of what adults are doing, right? It doesn't mean what they're doing doesn't make sense. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose. It's just that at that point in time, we cannot understand or fathom it. Number two, we're not so certain that we're the only life in the universe, you can't rule that out. You can't be, you can't be conclusive that we're the only life in the universe, mm -hmm. and you can't also conclude that, you know, whatever things you have out there don't serve a purpose. You may not understand the purpose right now, but maybe it's all linked. Maybe that's how uh, a whole bunch of dirt and nothingness is needed for the system to function properly. I mean, mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot of the human DNA is simply junk, right? But if you take out that junk, there's a big problem. So maybe <laughs> those junk are there for, <laughs> for a purpose, for a reason. But supposing there's, those junk uh, don't even serve any purpose. Let me quote Norman Donald, my favorite comedian. He said, mm -hmm. sometimes there doesn't have to be a point to everything. You know, sometimes there is no point to some things, right? It doesn't mean that thing doesn't exist. It can exist without it having a point. But I think that uh, the way the universe is structured does have a point. And I think uh, we may not understand what the point is at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Maybe with, you know, with, with time, with more scientific developments and achievements and all that, we'll come to understand what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But... You know, the, 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 the question, Bertrand Russell once said that nothing has to have an answer. The universe just is there, and that's all. You know, sometimes, you know, an answer doesn't need to be had. 
And so in that vein of, you know, and, and as you just said, you know, we don't always need to have a reason, you know, it, uh, again, it, it, it forces us to ask the question, why do we need God as the reason for the existence? There's no, there's no, there's no reason yeah, I, for it. The, the reason, the reason for it might be irrelevant. What is relevant is it exists. The reason for it, we might differ, we might disagree on what are the reasons I have. I have my answer to the reason for our existence. It is stated in the Bible, right? It's for us to, a God Almighty wanted to have fellowship with beings that he is created and for us to worship him, right? Yeah. So that's the reason. Not everybody would accept that as a reason, but it is totally irrelevant. What if that's not the reason he decided to create? Maybe it's another reason that we're not aware of, but the fact that we're not aware of that reason doesn't invalidate our existence or that he created us. It just is he created. Isn't that, uh, well, well, let me ask you this question. Isn't this kind of dangerously close to <laughs> what Sam Harris accused Jordan Peterson of, 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 of Jesus smuggling? We don't know the answer, oh. therefore, Jesus. No, no, no. I, I don't, you don't think, think it's so. Even remo- no, it's not remotely close at all uh, to say because we don't know the answer, Je- Jesus. I mean, how does that fit in? Can you uh, be more elaborate on how that fits in? Well, I mean, we're, we're we're talking about why is there you know something rather than nothing, and. You know, the, 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 the big question really here is, is that we both don't know how it happened. Um, one one uh, argument put forward by yourself is, is God. God did that. Um, mine is, is that the same result could have happened without him. And so anytime we have something that we simply can't explain, purely because religion offers us, an answer doesn't necessarily mean that that's the truest answer. So the, you know, the, the, the concern that I have is that when we look at things that we don't understand and we automatically place that on the altar of God's responsibility to explain when sometimes that explanation isn't needed, it just is. Okay. So I would say that the explanation is needed because Let's say, for example, we're, we're in, engaging in an intellectual exercise. Mm-hmm. We both are not certain of our position. We're just postulating. You've got right. to ask yourself, in this theorizing, which is more plausible, which is more logical? And as we have seen, my position, my worldview of something always existing, and that thing being God makes more sense for the fact that we exist if something has always existed then it is very easy for that something to lead to other things if nothing has ever existed which is not your position because you believe that something has always existed right if nothing from the scientific point of view because they believe the universe just gave birth to itself out of nothing i mean that's silly like that's literally (laughs) silly (laughs) <laughs> that goes into myth making the universe can't no. give birth to itself something can't give birth to itself so you you then ask which of these two worldviews makes more sense which is much more logical which is much more coherent and at that this point in time i think mine is much more coherent so whether or not whether or not it is true as opposed to the contrary opinion this is more coherent this makes more sense. Mm. And and so I, I, I kind of stand opposed to that because I think there doesn't need to be an explanation or a why necessarily, but I'm curious to, to, to understand how. And that's that's really my big uh, my big question and then the position that I hold is is how did it happen? And that's something that we might not ever be able to understand, but there's there's certain things that we can look at and we don't need the existence of God to give us a reason or a, or, or a why, uh, take gravity for existence. We don't know how gravity works. We understand, let me rephrase that. We don't understand the mechanics of how gravity works. 
but we or or why it works, but we know how it works. We can calculate it. We can we can uh, we can calculate trajectories and you know precisely enough that we can land a lunar module on the moon or a module on Mars, which is trillions of miles away with almost pinpoint accuracy. I mean, we, we, I think we've got between five to 10 meters of our, you know, intended destination. That's, that's insane. And that's because we understand the math, but the, 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 the issues that come up when we talk about how well this universe is put together kind of ignores how unwell it is actually put together. And what I mean by that is, is that we have, we have things that don't make any damn sense. Black holes for one, time dilations. We have this interesting phenomenon where time passes differently dependent upon the mass of an object it passes by. And so the world doesn't necessarily, or the universe doesn't necessarily make a lot of, of, of consistent sense in that sense. So it's it's not like the 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 classic watchmakers uh, you know argument where you know this finely tuned universe uh, can't come out of anything. It has to have a watchmaker. Well, it's not exactly as fine tuned as we believe it is. There's a lot of inconsistency in the universe. Um, so in that sense, there there still remains that question. You know why why put things in that don't make any sense? You know what I mean? If if uh, if God is the creator, it makes more sense to me that there are things that we don't understand that are emergent properties of a universe that is inherently chaotic. Okay. So, yeah, Christina is asking, what if there was never nothing? I think we've covered that. Um, my position is there was. there's always been something. There was never nothing, right? Um, but maybe As we'll get mine. back to that. Yeah. So, so to answer your question, Steve, I think I've answered it before, but maybe I'll just reiterate. The thing is, your question is some things don't make any sense. And one answer to it is that, well, well not everything has a point. That's, that's the cynical answer. Not everything has a point. Now, the much more coherent answer is our level of understanding, like I said earlier based on our human capacity to understand things at this point in time some things don't make sense hmm? now that is that is totally whether it makes sense whether we understand it is is totally div divorced from its understandability the truth of it right so whether or not i understand algebra doesn't make algebra false Algebra just exists. My understanding of it or my non-understanding of it doesn't limit the existence of algebra. Mm -hmm. so, so what it means is that those things that may not make sense, right, may not make sense because of we not being able to fully grasp those concepts or what they are or what purpose they serve. And we not being able to do that doesn't invalidate the purpose they serve. We don't know what purpose they serve, but you know, that's that may be a function of our limited capacity to understand things rather than it's not making sense. Right. So what 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 answers do do or what answers does God give us about these these phenomena? What answers do, does God give us about this phenomena? Right. Uh, so uh, I won't I won't be able to tell you categorically what answers god gives about this phenomena or why they are why such an explanation is necessary to why it is necessary to prove or disprove the existence of god right i mean if someone makes a shitty car the fact that they've made elon musk has made a shitty car the cyber truck is a shitty vehicle from all the reviews <laughs> of it, yeah. doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that the car wasn't made by someone just because there are so many flaws. I mean, the, the, the boots can literally take off your finger, right? The pedals can uh, get stuck and it will be on maximum acceleration. And so many other things. For the fact that he made a shitty car is not a, an argument against 
his existence. It's just that he made a shitty car. In <laughs> fact, if, if anything, it's a confirmation that someone did something. Sure, I, I understand that. But those are those are infinite worlds apart from the main primary question, which is, you know, how, how does God explain to us these these phenomena? Because that's that's really the crux of the question is what answers can God give us that are different than those that we seek for in science? Uh, and I, I think the answer still comes to zero because neither of us can really truly explain what happened at the creation of the universe exactly. I mean, science has, you know, the, the cosmic background radiation, which are, which is the radiation that is the leftover cooling of, of the expansion of the universe. And we know that it exists. We have a map of it. And we know that we can't see beyond 13.4 billion years because that's the, that's, you know, that, that limitation is set by the speed of light. We can't see past how far the universe has, uh, has existed because the light hasn't traveled to us yet. But, you know, the, 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 the problem that consistently remains in my head is, is if, if there's nothing that God has to answer or, or if there's nothing that God can answer for that which science can't answer yet either, then there's no reason for me to suspect that God exists either. Well, if science can't answer it, science can't answer it. It has nothing at all. At least God has something. You may disagree with it. You may say it doesn't make sense, but it does have something. Take, for example, we can see, let's look at Earth. Why is there life on Earth as opposed to Mercury, as opposed to Venus and all that? The mm. reason is because the conditions that are suitable for life are found here on Earth. The gold, gold, Goldilocks zone, yeah. So that's a that's a purpose. That's a that's something. That's perhaps the reason why there is life on Earth is dependent or somewhat linked with there not being life on Mercury. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's all connected. I made an example of the dot um, elements that we have in in DNA, right? They literally don't, majority of the DNA literally do not do anything. But if you take them out, if you take those, those parts of the DNA that are quote unquote dead, then you're going to create a lot of damage. But from just looking at it from the outside, the first thing you say, oh, but this serves no function. Why is it here? But it, it's doing something for the other functional parts. But the fact that we don't understand why it's there doesn't mean it's not relevant, doesn't mean it, it isn't doing something. So maybe tomorrow we decide to, we have enough technology to terraform Mercury and we go to yeah. Mercury and we make it habitable. What consequences might that have for the ecosystem of right. the world? What consequences might that have for, for maybe the tidal waves in, on Earth? Maybe the the moon's uh, gravitational pull on the oceans. We, there's no way to know, right? But it's very, it's very, it, it very well, well might be that those things are connected. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah.